president who seemingly tweets every passing thought, Russia manipulating social media to divide us, proof that there is a downside to the internet echo chamber. Let's discuss now with Frank Bruni of the New York Times. Michael D'Antonio is the author of The Truth About Trump. Gentlemen, good evening. So, there's a method to our madness. I have you here because you wrote something about this. Your piece is titled, Frank, you said, um, you said the internet will be the death of us, okay? And you said, at first I was like, the death of the U.S., which is just <laughs> but it's the death of us. And you say, no. uh, it is a tool for learning, roving, and constructive community building, but it's uh, unrivaled, too, in the spread of lies, narrowing of interest, and erosion of common cause. Please give us some examples of that. With the Internet, we are now, individuals, are kind of curating their information diets. They're, they're curating their news consumption in a way where they can tune out anything that doesn't fit their pre-existing worldview. They can tuck themselves into echo chambers where they only hear what they already believe, what they want to believe. And we've recently had two horrifying examples of this. Mm. Um, I'm going to say his name wrong, but Cesar Sayoc, who yeah. sent the pipe bomb, allegedly sent the pipe bombs. Um, and then Robert Bowers with the massacre in Pittsburgh. In both cases, those men spent enormous time online. And what they were doing online was they were finding communities of people who believed in the same dark things they did, who reinforced those beliefs, who colored them darker still. And we have to ask some really serious questions about whether people who are already prone to hate are actually being pushed all the way to violence by the encouragement, by the reinforcement that they get online. Have we reached a point, look, even here, I'll present, I'll just speak for myself, I know the net, folks in the network too, too, we'll present factual information, back it up with examples, right, concrete empirical evidence, and people say, oh, that's not true, or it's fake news. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm often shocked by the amount of propaganda that people believe. Are we, have we reached a point where propaganda uh, can pass as true well, and but lies? Here, here's why that happens. And I was thinking about this when I was watching, watching CNN earlier this evening. And on Anderson's show, he was going through all the lies in the president's uh, speech, for lack of a better word, on immigration today. Because the internet gives you all of these kind of tiny niches you can go into, because even the TV dial gives you so many options, mm -hmm. you can tell yourself you're extremely well informed because you have all of these sites bookmarked, because you're following these 100 people on Twitter, because you're watching some TV, but you can never stumble across a show that's actually giving you objective, dispassionate facts. And so you end up, what the internet does for you is, it, is it, you end up overfed and undernourished. Mm. Inundated, but not necessarily informed. But not informed. Yeah. Uh, so, did you want to say something before I well, I think that's a brilliant analysis. And I was speaking with someone earlier today who actually had been hired by Facebook years ago when they were going to consider looking into the news diet that people were getting on Facebook. Facebook brought in a whole bunch of journalists. These were professionals that actually informing people. And within a year, they fired them all. They decided that they were going to buy into this utopian idea that the internet was going to provide us with a, a plethora of sources, and everybody was going to be very keen on informing themselves well. Well, really, people separated themselves into tribes, and yes. now the tribes are getting more and more exclusive. Uh, Donald Trump would like an echo chamber of one, so he could hear his own <laughs> voice all the time. Well, speaking of, let me right. ask you this, because you know him very well, right? You're, you're the biographer here. Um, he's got over 55 million Twitter followers, right? And, and yet he capitalizes on that reach um, to reach out to his base. But he doesn't like to use email. I'm not sure if he has an email account. Who knows? But it's widely known the White House states print out emails and documents for the president to read. Mm -hmm. How did he get to Twitter? How does he... Well, you know, I think that's a technology that he's mastered because it matters to him, and it's only a limited number of characters and words. He actually, if you think, think about it, is a 1970s tabloid newspaper. I just answered my own question in my head, but go on. Right. <laughs> he's a, no one wants to hear more of what Donald Trump has to say than himself and, than these than himself and putting it out there. Yeah, go ahead. Right, and he, he is writing New York Post headlines circa 1980. This is how he's always thought, and he's always mastered these niches. There, there's, there's another reason he loves Twitter, which is it provides this instant odometer of approval. Right. You send out the tweet, and then you look, oh, who liked it? Who shared it? It's a wonderful instant feeling of validation if you're someone like Trump. It, 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 he told me he was going to run for president in 2014 based on Twitter. <laughs> he said, everybody's he on Twitter right, is right? telling me to do it. Right. And... He knew at that time that half of his followers were bots. Mm. 
Yeah. That's he went out and purchased <laughs> millions of followers in the Philippines and other places. So the bots were telling him to run, but that really was him telling it's himself so, to it's run. It's interesting to me because um, I just, like, I, I don't even read the comments anymore. I may as well turn the comments off on all of my social media because mm -hmm. I don't read it. People say, did you see that such and such said? I'm like, no, why are you reading that? Like, who, who cares? Yeah, you get that into your head, it's a big danger. But there's one other really crucially important thing about social media we have to say. Not only can you use it to only follow people whom you agree with, mm -hmm. et cetera, but the algorithms encourage more of that. So right. I go on Facebook, if I like something, if I share something, I'm gonna see more from that person, I'm gonna see more of that kind. And if you think about the way that works, it takes a narrow interest of yours, and it makes it narrower and narrower until you are just spinning in a rut. And they even you know, send you ads of like, if you clicked on something on the internet, like if I bought a backpack the other night, it's like, okay, I bought one. I don't need any more backpack ads, right? Right, but next you'll so get other mountaineering <laughs> gear ads for those things, but it, they're, they're forcing you into this, this, this limited neighborhood where you're only gonna see reflections of yourself. You're yeah. just backpack man. You you're backpack man. Yeah. But also, it's interesting because we talked about this racist ad that the president retweeted yeah. yesterday, and it was interesting that he would use his Twitter page to put out something that is that many people are saying is worse. Interesting is worse, a kind word, Don Lemon. <laughs> this racist ad that's worse than, than, than Willie Horton. But it's also a straight line to others, not only his followers, and I say followers, right? No decision you say supporters, followers, because mm -hmm. that's what it has become. Mm -hmm. But to every journalist who then amplify what he says, even if it's right or wrong, even if it's embellishment or a lie, people are still amplifying it. In many ways, we do that here on cable news, too, because we put it on, we'll run it, and then people believe it before we have a chance to fact check it. Yes. Or at least he sets the terms of the conversation. I mean, this happened Tuesday. At the beginning of Tuesday, we heard that he had said with an executive order, I'm going to end birthright citizenship. He is not going to be able to do that. I don't think he believes he can do that. No. But for 24 hours, what were we talking about? Immigration and birthright citizenship. Well, and also remember Victory Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I'm going to do the tax cut. People still believe those things. I was listening to, um, on my way home last night, um, Randy Kay's story on Anderson's show. And just to listen to the people in the crowd, what they believe, well, he's going to, you know, he can, he's going to change the whole, what you said, birthright citizenship. And he said, well, you realize you can't do it. No, he, he's going to do it. <laughs> so do you think it's an election tactic so close to election day that these people aren't anywhere near? No, it's, they believe it's imminent. Like yeah. that the folks are on our border, they actually believe it. So they believe that an invasion is imminent. They believe that our troops need because to be sent. Because he said it. There are people who are now talking about sending drones to interdict the caravan. <laughs> 500 miles into Mexico because they're panicked about this fake invasion. I would challenge everyone to <laughs> walk, just, just try to walk 500 miles and see how fast you get to somewhere. Or well, 800 this miles is, or 1,000 miles. This is the miles. world we, this is Donald Trump's mind that we're all living inside of he, now. Yeah. Yeah. He has created this narrative that has, at this point, in terms of the caravan, no relationship whatsoever to the truth. But he's, yeah. not, he yeah. said, what did he say? I tell the truth when I can. Right. Yeah, which apparently <laughs> he can't do that very often. <laughs> Thank you, God. I gotta run. I gotta run. We'll continue this conversation. Okay. Uh, maybe one day over by a s snowy fire or something. Snowy fire. You know what? It wouldn't be a snowy fire. Uh, a snowy day by a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, with his racist comments catching up to him, members of his own party turning against him. Eight term Iowa Congressman Steve King is facing what's shaping up to be the battle of his political life.